So we're doing, as I said, a little mini series only because I just felt as I was doing the stuff in, in, in December that this is where the Lord was directing us. Because I kept running into things. I kept running into some of you uh, walking down the hallway and you're asking me these really tough questions. And like I said, I can't, I can't answer them in, 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 in 10 seconds, 20 seconds. I just, it just doesn't give it justice. And I keep running into challenges. Uh, how many of you know I'm kind of a Facebook preacher? I didn't mean to be, but it's, it's kind of morphed into that. I mean, I just get these barrages of challenging questions. Some of you are watching on my timeline, and you see I'm, I'm out there, you know. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer. And I thought, I need, as, a, as your pastor, it is my responsibility to equip you to be able to answer, to equip you to be able to go do ministry, to speak into other people's lives. So I've got to answer some really tough questions. And I asked you to write down what those questions might be so that I could, I could answer them directly instead of guessing. And I'm being, I don't mean to be mean, but I got exactly one slip of paper last week. Okay, so if you don't have questions and you know it all, then maybe I'm misreading and understanding what you need. But please write them down if you have those questions. And this series will go as long as it takes until I've answered everything. Now, I, or, I may not get to everything, but I'm certainly going to try. Now, today, I'm going to be talking about what do we do with those weird laws that we find in the Old Testament. How many of you have ever run into something like that? You've been reading the book of Leviticus, and you're looking at this, and you're going, I don't understand why I am not allowed to be touched by anybody during my monthly menstrual cycle. This, this is not good. Unclean. And you read this stuff and you go, how do I deal with that in the 21st century? You know, how do, I, how do I incorporate that? How do I answer the world that challenges? For example, this was on the Internet. I'm going to read this to you. And uh, this was an open letter. And I'm not going to read the entire thing. I'm only going to read part of it. But this gives you an example of what's going on on the Internet. This was up on the Internet less than a week ago. Listen. It says, thank you for doing so much to educate people regarding God's law. I have learned a great deal from your show, and I try to share that knowledge with as many people as I can. And when someone tries to defend the homosexual lifestyle, for example, I simply remind him that Leviticus 18.22 clearly states it to be an abomination. End of debate. I do need some advice from you, however, regarding some of the specific laws and how to best follow them. For example, I would like to sell my daughter into slavery, as sanctioned in Exodus chapter 21, verse 7. In this day and age, what do you think would be a fair price for her? I have a neighbor who insists on working on the Sabbath. Exodus 35, verse 2 clearly states that he should be put to death. Am I morally obligated to kill him myself? My uncle has a farm. He violates Leviticus 19.19 19 by planting two different crops in the same field, as does his wife by wearing garments made of two different kinds of thread, cotton and polyester blend. He also tends to curse and blaspheme a lot. Is it really necessary that we go to all of the trouble of getting the whole town together to stone them, as it says in Leviticus 24, verses 10 through 16? Or shouldn't we just burn them to death at a private family affair like we do with people who sleep with their in-laws, as in Leviticus 20, verse 14? Now, a friend of mine feels that even though eating shellfish is an abom abomination, according to Leviticus chapter 11, verse 10, is it a lesser abomination than homosexuality? I don't agree. Can you settle this? I know you have studied these things extensively. So I am confident that you can help. Thank you again for reminding all of us that God's word is eternal and unchanging. Now, how many of you can see the mocking tone in that? Like, you know, that's floating around the Internet. Now, that's been around since actually uh, year 2000. That was an open letter to Dr. Laura. And, uh, but it's still around. Even as recently as last week, I had quotes from this uh, that were thrown at me as a challenge. See, Letters like this, 
And comments like this, how many of you know it's very common? You've probably heard this. You've probably been challenged at somewhere in your life that if you're a Christian and you say that certain moral behaviors are wrong, they're going to throw it back in your face, something like this. Isn't that correct? This is common. Now, the first thing I want you to understand is that this is actually what we call a logical fallacy. Now, a logical fallacy, a fallacy means something that's irrational. By definition, it's not true. It's irrational. Now, this is a fallacy called the fallacy of the appeal to emotion. What it is, is it's an attempt to persuade you about something. It's an attempt to convince people that biblical morality is somehow dangerous or should be rejected. But they do this not by making a logical argument or not by trying to defend a point, but simply by stirring up emotions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab a scripture. I'm not going to consider the context from which that scripture comes. I'm going to try to apply it into, the, into some nonsensical 21st century scenario and stir up emotions and everybody's going to get upset about it and I'm going to sit back in the corner smugly and saying, see, I've destroyed biblical morality. That's what it is. It's a logical fallacy. Now, you add on top of that, add on top of that, how many of you know there's a current fad running around of don't judge? I mean, that, that's the fad, isn't it? I mean, we, we, we shouldn't judge. It seems like the whole world is trying to shout, don't judge any behavior as wrong because Jesus, after all, he wouldn't do that. He is the one that said, don't judge in Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Don't believe me? Bill O'Reilly said that last week. I was watching it on millions of people watching, and he's saying, we're all sinners. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. We shouldn't judge anybody. Now, the, first of all, the hypocrisy of Mr. Bill for saying that. Because he's the same guy that calls people loons and says he has a whole segment of his show called Pinheads and Patriots. Now listen, if you're calling somebody a pinhead, you have judged them a pinhead. So standing up and saying you should not judge, and of course you're a loon if you're on the left. Okay, wait a second. I think you're misunderstanding. Okay, you know, and Bill, give me a call. We'll discuss it. Now, the thing is, there is an attitude out there that you can't judge anything. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull things out of context, out of the Old Testament. Why do we do that? Why do people in the world do that? It reminds me, actually, how many of you have seen the video, the movie, The Incredibles? How many of you have seen that? Now, the bad guy in The Incredibles, his name is Syndrome. Now, Syndrome is not a super, all right? He doesn't have superpowers. But what he's done is he's gone out and he's created all these inventions so that he can fly, so that he can be strong. And he, he gets to a place where he's, he's explaining to the supers why it is that he's made all of these inventions. He says, I want to make these inventions so that everybody can be super. And then he looks into the camera and he says, because if everybody is super, then no one is. You see it? You see, in my view, that, that, that seems to be the motivation behind this kind of a letter, this kind of an attack. See, Christians who speak up against any moral behavior, well, abortion, fornication, sleeping with, uh, you know, living with your boyfriend, girlfriend before you get married, um, uh, homosexual marriage, homosexual activity, any of these types of things, the attitude, the implication is that we stand up against those things and we're hypocrites because we don't also speak up against other things. And our book, our Bible, supports things that are a contradiction. Things like we just read, slavery, and why don't we stone people for not coming to church on the Sabbath day? I, you know, I think it would be a rather strong motivation for you to be here, personally. But, you know, but they, they, they say you're a hypocrite. But you know what that really is? They're really trying to do this. They're trying to say, if everyone's a sinner, then no one really is. They're doing the same thing that Syndrome's trying to do. They're trying 
to compare apples to oranges and prove a point. And they're wrong. And we need to understand why. We're Christians, but we don't just live in the New Testament. There are lots of Christians that have never even read the Old Testament because it just seems weird. How many of you know what I'm talking about? It's just, it's just kind of out there. <laughs> I mean, excuse me. You, 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 you see these Old Testament regulations about foods that you can and cannot eat. You see these, you know, skin diseases, and you're going, ugh. You know what I mean? And, I mean, you can't trim your beard. I don't even have a beard. All right, you're not allowed to shave certain sides. Of, I'm in trouble, okay? You know what I mean? I mean, having tattoos, I mean, it's, that's in Leviticus. And, and don't boil a baby goat in its mother's milk. Now, I don't know about you, but that is not something I am interested in for dinner. It's just never crossed my mind. It has not been a temptation to me. And I'm, you read that stuff, and you go, I don't get it. It just seems odd, weird, kooky, out there, arbitrary even, kind of out of the blue and even harsh. And you've got to go, how do I reconcile that Old Testament stuff with being a Christian and Loving your neighbor. I mean, it doesn't seem very loving to your neighbor to throw rocks at him if he doesn't show up at church. I mean, I, I don't get it. It doesn't seem very loving to your neighbor to take all of the women and on their menstrual cycle, they have to go outside the camp because they're unclean. It does not seem right. And you don't know how to reconcile it. And I want to help you do that today, or at least start. I'm not going to be able to answer every question, but I'm going to at least give you a basis of how to deal this. You know why? Because that same Old Testament, those same 39 books, listen carefully to me on this, there are 2,600 places where it flat out claims, these are the words of God himself, thus saith the Lord. I mean, you don't get any more powerful confirmation than that, that the Old Testament is the word of God. And Jesus confirmed it, didn't he? I mean, in John chapter 10, verse 35, Jesus says the Old Testament scriptures cannot be broken. In fact, he says not even one little tiny jot, which is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, will pass away before everything is fulfilled. It's eternal. It's forever. And when you look at that, you go, well, then why, why don't we do that? Why, why do we have these weird laws? Well, what it means is, and listen carefully to this, it means there's something in those weird laws that you and I need to understand, or it wouldn't be there. Does that make sense? God would not have preserved it if it was not important. In fact, in the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this, verse 14. He says, now you must remain faithful to the things that you have been taught. That is the Old Testament, guys. you got to remain faithful to it if you're a Christian today. Because you know they are true. And you know you can trust those who taught you. You can trust the prophets. Now, you've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood. He's talking about the Old Testament now. And they have given you the wisdom. See, there's something there. There's wisdom there. To receive what? The salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus Christ. Now, that's important. He's saying that the Old Testament shows you Jesus. That's what he's trying to say there. Isn't that powerful? He's going, it's, the wisdom is there. You learned it. You can see it now. Now, most of us don't because we're not Jewish and we didn't grow up memorizing the first five books of the Bible. We should. Now, here's the kicker, verse 16. All Scripture, not some, all, is inspired by God. And it is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It straightens us out. It teaches us to do what is right. Now, it is God's way of preparing us, how? In every way, fully equipped, which is what I'm trying to do for you today, equip you. What? For every good thing that God wants us to do. That Old Testament stuff, it says it was inspired, just like the New Testament. Now, that word inspired in Greek is a powerful word. Theonostos. Theonostos means inspired but it comes from two words, theo and nuos, which means God breathed. I mean, it doesn't get any more direct than that. He's trying to say that those Old Testament scriptures, everything in there, God himself 
breathed it. Therefore, it is without error, guys. It is there for a purpose, and it's eternal. And it is all useful, even in the 21st, 21th century, depending on how you look at it. All of that has an explanation, and there are answers to these issues. And that is the key I want you to grab first. Understand this. This is what he's saying about you can trust the Holy Scriptures. You and I should not be afraid. We simply should not be afraid of the criticisms that the Bible gets because it's always had critics and it always will. You know why? Because a careful study, which we're going to start today, will confirm that all of God's Word is useful to us even today. And we're going to begin right about now. The first thing you need to understand about these strange scriptures that you just can't get your head wrapped around. Now, this is going to kind of blow you away, and this may be a teaching you've never heard before. But you need to understand that there is a difference. Listen carefully to me now. There is a difference between the law of God and the law of Moses. Most people don't know that. There is a difference between the law of God And the law of Moses. Now, the laws of Moses are the laws of God. Yes, that's correct. I don't want anybody to think I'm saying that the laws of Moses are not the laws of God. But there's a difference between the two. And you can see it in Scripture because if you go to Exodus chapter 20 where you see the Ten Commandments, it says, the Lord says, and then it gives you the Ten Commandments. And then the very next chapter it says, and the Lord says to the people of Israel, there's a difference between these two things. In other words, the Ten Commandments are God's universal laws for everyone, everywhere. It is his standard of morality, and it does not change. However, the laws of Moses, there's something else. They are an expression of the Ten Commandments. They're a way of showing the Ten Commandments in operation, and they were designed for one group of people at one time in history. That's very, very important. Now, what do I mean? I mean, it's kind of like romantic love. I have a romantic love feeling. I can express that in poetry. But I can also express it in music. I can also express it in dinner for two. I can express it in buying flowers. Now, is buying flowers any more real a way of expressing my love than poetry? No, it's just a different way. And quite frankly, different ladies are going to receive romantic love in different ways. My lady, buying her flowers does not express love to her. That express waste of money. All right, but to other ladies, that may be an expression of love that is perfectly valid for her. But for my lady, spending time with her, dinner for two, I'm a winner. Okay, that's good. That's not a waste of money. All right, now, you just got to kind of know these things as you get older. But uh, the point is this. All of those ways, poetry, music, dinner for two, buying flowers, they're all expressions of romantic love. And in the same way, the Ten Commandments are expressed in different ways. For the Jewish people, at that time in history, God gave them a way of expressing the Ten Commandments. He has given us a new way. It's called a new covenant where he wrote those commandments on our hearts. And we function in a different way now because Jesus has died on the cross and risen again from the dead. We'll get to that in a minute. But the point is this. Listen carefully. The point is this. There are 613 laws that you will find in the book of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. 613 is a lot. 613. Now, those laws were specifically designed for the Jewish people, and it was specifically temporary. You can see that in Jeremiah chapter 31 if you want to read it, or Ezekiel 36. You see, the point was this. God was trying to get a special people. Not all people, a special people. The Jewish people. They were supposed to be a model. 
They were supposed to be a theocracy. That means God rules them. We're, how many of you know we're a democracy? Well, not really. We're kind of a monarchy. But anyway, um, in my opinion, that's another issue. But <laughs> we're supposed to be a democracy anyway. Uh, but the, the point is, democracy means rule of the people. Theocracy means rule of God. So this was designed for a theocracy. It's not designed, these, these 613 laws weren't designed for uh, democracies today. That's not what they were for. They were specific to the Jewish people, and they were never intended for all peoples and all cultures and all time periods, not those 613 laws. And all of those 613 laws, you will find, if you study them, they are all symbols. Every single one of them are a symbol. Every feast, every reason for uncleanness, every way to get clean, every type of sacrifice, everything is a symbol. Everything is pointing somewhere. It illustrates in some way the Ten Commandments, and in some way it points to the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus of Nazareth. And you can see that. It's a really cool thing. I'll just give you a quick example. For example... It, we saw in that letter the idea of planting two types of seeds or, or having two types of, you know, you know cotton blend and a, and a polyester and how that was, was, was wrong for the Jewish people. Why was it wrong for them? Because, you see, it was a reminder to the Jewish people. Listen, guys, I have called you to be my special people. You're supposed to be an illustration to the whole planet. And my very first law is you shall have no other gods other than me. You won't mix me with anything or anyone. There's no grab a little spirituality from Baal and Ashtoreth and this and that and stick it together and call it good. No, it doesn't work that way. You don't mix anything with me. And to remind you of that, I won't even let you put two different types of seed in your field because you'll go, you know why I can't do that? Because there's only one God. You know why I can't wear two different types of thread? Because there's only one God. It is a reminder to you right down to what you wear and what you eat out of the field. Now, was that intended for everybody everywhere? No. It was a symbol to the Jewish people. They lived this way so that everybody looking in would go, wow. They are single-minded in their purpose. I should be too. And when you and I as Christians look back on that and go, man, if they were so committed to the idea that there's only one God, that they wouldn't even plant two different types of seeds, should you and I be careful what we watch on TV? Because we're mixing things. What kind of, how many of you read your horoscope? Don't. Do you see what I'm saying? We should be reminded, no, 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 there, there, there's only one God. We don't mix him with any other spirituality. Uh-uh, no, 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 no. And if we have to remind ourselves right down to what we wear, then maybe we should. But that's what it was all about. That is why, guys, there is a great value in studying those 613 laws. Don't ignore God's Word. Read through it again, and you will find a deeper understanding of the Ten Commandments. That was the intent. Now, did they get it? Say no. No, after a while, it became just following the rules, and then they added some more of their own. Does that make sense? And Jesus ran up against that. He said, Boys, you missed the point. You way missed the point. All of these rules were given to you to point you to the deeper meaning of the Ten Commandments, and you missed it. I mean, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you what? Even if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've already committed the sin with her. What he's trying to say is, look, I gave you a whole bunch of rules on who could sleep with who and where and who could marry what. And I mean, I did all this to try to point you back to you shall not commit adultery and to get you to the deeper level of it. But you missed it. And you're looking for loopholes all the time. Jesus came up against that hard, didn't he? And you and I are going to come up against it hard too. We've got to understand that there is a deeper meaning in the Ten Commandments, and those 613 laws were designed for the Jewish people in order to be able to express it, to help us understand the depth of it. But listen, the entire ceremonial law, all of the ceremonies about washing this and washing that and wearing this and you know shaving yourself and all this sort of thing, all those sacrifices, all the feasts, had seven feasts during the year, which animal was clean? Which animal was not clean? 
all of those things were fulfilled. They were completed. They were done in Jesus. Why? Because he's the ultimate sacrifice. If you have a whole bunch of laws that are related to sacrifice and you don't need to do a sacrifice anymore because Jesus did the ultimate sacrifice, then all of those laws are completed. This is why we don't have to worry about whether or not we eat shellfish anymore. Does that make sense? I hope that helps you understand. Now, to give you a deeper meaning of it, Hebrews 7, 27 sums it up this way. It says, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day like the other high priests. They did this back in the past for their own sins first and then the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he sacrificed himself on the cross. He's showing, saying, hey, back then they did all these sacrifices for their sins and the sins of the people. But now Jesus did it for everybody. That's why the law is complete. That's why the Mosaic law, the laws of Moses, but the laws of God, the Ten Commandments, they're forever. They go on. Does that make sense? Okay, I want you to really get that. Because those 613 laws, all of them foreshadow something about Jesus, about his life. They're just shadows. They're just types. All of the sacrifices relate to him. Don't they? And you, if you go and study it, you'll find it. Some of it will blow your doors off. You'll go, wow, I didn't know that was in the Bible. I mean, there, just give you one example, right? Not even in my notes. There is a specific type of sacrifice that was never made. It was a sacrifice for a leper to be cleansed. And it's in the Old Testament. And it had never been used because there had never been a leper that had been cleansed until Yeshua showed up and heal the leper. And what did he say? Go to the priest for the proper sacrifice. You know why he did that? He did it on purpose. He put it right in the high priest's face. This sacrifice has never been used, but it's been in the Old Testament because it points to me, and I just healed him. Now do it. And that proves I am who I said I am. Does that make sense? I mean, ev- right down to that uh, special sacrifice for a leper, was put in there to point to Jesus several thousand years later. That's, that should give you a little tingle. You know, I mean, that, it's there. It's amazing stuff when you read it. But you know, there's another thing we need to understand about these laws. Now, I want you to understand, God's a rather practical God. How many of you knew that? I mean, he's very practical. And he works to lead you and I, human beings, back to his ideal. But God has created human beings to be unbelievably special. Of all the creations in all the universe, you and you alone have been created in the image of God. You know what that image is? We think of it as head and shoulders, knees and toes. But that's not what he means. The image of God is your ability to freely make a moral choice. You have an ability and a right to make a free moral choice. No other creature on earth. No other creature in the spiritual world has that right or that power. It's true. Angels have the power to make a moral choice, but no right to, which is why there's no redemption for them. And when they fall, it's forever. It's done. Does that make sense? There's no redemption for them. I don't know why, and I don't want to get into arguing with God about that. I just know that human beings have the right and have the power because we're made in His image. And God loves you so much because you're made in that image that he's not going to violate your will, even when you do really bad stuff. Does that make sense? So God is practical. He wants to work people back to the ideal that he created in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. And we have fallen away from that ideal. Now, it's easy to think. It's easy to think that our modern views about things like slavery or the Sabbath day, or cleanness or uncleanness. Our modern views are the correct views. But how many of you know that our modern Western views are not accepted by everybody on this planet today? There are nearly a billion people on this planet that believe that all Western values, how about the rights of women? Try to go to Saudi Arabia and argue that point. Or Iraq, or Iran, or Indonesia. You see what I'm saying? There's, there, there's a lot of people that view our Western views as backwards and evil. And, of course, we look at them as backwards and evil. It's all perspective, friends and neighbors. 
We think, well, we're right, 21st century, we know everything. Well, go to Saudi Arabia and argue that point if you survive. Now, there's a danger in trying to impose our ideas, our Western ideas, onto other mindsets. This is why trying to export democracy to Iraq and Afghanistan isn't working. This is why Fallujah fell yesterday. Why? Because you can't change 1,400 years of thinking in a day or even a year. We're so mystified in America. We went over there to give them freedom, and they killed us. We don't get it. They don't want freedom. No, they don't. They've been raised since they were this tall. They've been raised for thousands of years that Sharia is the law. They don't want the laws of America. And I don't care how you try to impose your mindset on that mindset. It isn't going to work because hearts have to be softened before you can do that. Hearts have to be softened. Does that make sense? God is not stupid. He knows that human hearts are hard as rocks. He gets it. And he understands, I can bring you my law, but I got I to gotta give you ways. I got to accommodate what's going on in your mindset. I have to do that. Let me give you an example. In 1865, we fought a war, 1860 to 1865, and the South lost. How many of you know that part? Okay. The South lost, and there was a surrender. The primary reason for the Civil War, contrary to people who try to rewrite history, was slavery. There's no doubt about it. But that was the issue. 600,000 people were killed and several million more wounded because of the argument about whether or not this institution should end in our country. That's not that long ago, 150 years. Slavery ended on this day. But the truth of the matter is, just putting new laws into place, how many of you know it didn't change the attitudes of people in the South? It didn't change those attitudes. A hundred years later, it still didn't change their attitudes. The civil rights movement had to come up and smack people in the head and say, you lost the war. Get over it. But people didn't want to. And there were riots in the streets. In my lifetime, in my lifetime, I actually have memories of this stuff, which scares me. It tells me how old I am. But still, the problem is, you can't change people's hearts overnight. And even today, how many of you know race is still an issue in this country? Now, if people would simply follow God's law, that there's only one race, the human race, this wouldn't be an issue. But people have hard hearts, and God knows it. So when God gave the law, he, he understood that uh, I have to give the law, you know, my eternal law, and I have to recognize the realities of the time period that this is coming into. I have to recognize the hard hearts that this is coming to, and I have to, I have to get them to understand the principles of my laws and move them back towards my ideal, but it's going to take time. Now, we do this all the time. So, lest you think I'm overstating the case, don't we do this all the time? I mean, we have a law in this country. Don't steal. How many of you know that's the law? You're not allowed to steal things. And how many of you know we express that law differently to someone who is three versus someone who is 13? We, it's the same law, but we express it differently to a three-year-old, to a 13-year-old, and to a 23-year-old. We're going to express it differently. I mean, my three-year-old who steals something might get scolded slash spanked. Spanked would be really important. My 13-year-old might get in real trouble at the principal's office, might end up on probation. But my 23-year-old might end up in handcuffs and in a prison cell. We express it very differently depending on where the person is, the development of their heart and their life. We reveal things very differently to these people too, don't we? depending on where they are, where their hearts are in life. Does that make sense? I mean, for example, I don't teach my biology lessons to my 3-year-old the same way as I do to the 13-year-old or to the 23-year-old. It depends on where they are. God is the same thing. The expectation is the same. You shall not steal. How I express it and how the consequences come out 
may be different depending on where you are in your life. God is the same way. And lest you think I'm, I'm, I'm overstating it again, God has done this in our history. For example, back when we were first created in Genesis, we were all vegetarians. There was no warrant for us to eat meat. Why? Because there was no death. What is, what is the wages of sin? Death. So when Adam and Eve, before they sinned, what do you eat? Plants. They're just chemical machines. There's no death. Does that make sense? So they were all vegetarians. But that changed after the flood. After the flood, they still ate vegetables, but they were also allowed to eat meat. And God said, you shall eat meat. Why? Because he wanted them to see the consequence of sin at every single dinner table. He wanted them to see the horror of killing something in order to eat so that you would know the consequences of your sin, so that you would not forget the flood. But then God changed it again with the Jewish people. He said, not only are you going to eat meat, but I'm going to make sure you only eat specific kinds of meat so that you can really see not only the consequences of sin, but you can see what my holiness is. And the Bible says that in the future it will change again. And we'll be back to being vegetarians. Why? Because there will be no death in heaven. How many of you knew that? And we will have bodies, physical bodies. Jesus ate food. And we will eat too. But I have a feeling that those vegetables will taste a lot like steak. I mean, just, (laughs) it's just me, you know. I'm praying for that anyway. It's just, you know, I don't do a lot of vegetables. That's just my thing, you know. But you know what, this is not, listen guys, this is not God changing his mind. Listen carefully. This is not God changing his mind or his moral standards. It's not. What it is, his rules to us may change based at various points of where we are in our, in our development, right? Just like we do with a three-year-old. But God's character and his moral standards, they never change. Murder is just always wrong, plain and simple. Adultery is always wrong. Now let's go back to some of those things. and We're going to go through them pretty quick because we're running out of time. Let's talk about that slavery issue. Now, slavery is still a touchy issue because it, it existed in this country. And there are 27 million people in slavery today, worldwide, right now. In fact, there are more people in slavery today than it ever in the history of the world. That's a fact. So what do we talk about when we talk about slavery? Now, slavery, first of all, I want you to understand the Bible does not commend or endorse slavery. It simply recognized that slavery existed at that time, so God gave regulations on it. Does that make sense? It it was there. It flourished in the ancient world. You got to understand, there were no bankruptcy laws in those days. There There were no retirement programs. It didn't exist. So what do you do if you don't want to starve to death? You sell yourself into servanthood. That's what you do. Or you sell one of your kids into it. Now, that sounds harsh, but think about it. If you are destitute, you have nothing. Your kids are starving to death. Better to sell them to a rich man who will make sure they are fed than watch them die. See, that's what slavery was in those days. It's not God's ideal, but it was there. So God came up with regulations. You can find this in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 40, where God gave not only could you not abuse a servant, not only did you have to treat them fairly, unlike all other ancient systems, but you had to set them free when their debt was paid off. Unlike the Babylonians or the Egyptians or whatever. I mean, God's laws on the slavery thing were were head and shoulders above what was going on around. Slavery wasn't his ideal. In fact, the biblical principle is to end it. The biblical principle is to love others as you love yourself. And if you look carefully, you will see examples in the Old Testament in particular. Abraham had a servant. His name was Eleazar, remember? And he loved his master because Abraham treated him really well. Does that make sense? You know, uh, do I think slavery is a good thing? No. Do I think that uh, God approves of it? No, but God understands the hardness of human hearts. And he's going to do what he can to create a society that shows how to treat people decently. And if you think very carefully, there are entire segments of this society that are standing out on our street corners today with signs waving them around saying that we're a little better than slaves because we work at Walmart. And we only make minimum wage. And those rich people up there are exploiting us. Nothing has changed. 
Does that make sense? We should have laws that tell people, you know, hey, you can't treat, you can't exploit people, you can't do this. I agree with that. But nothing has changed. Human hearts are still hard. People will still exploit others. And if we don't have laws to protect them, it's going to go from bad to worse. And in fact, it was the principles of the Bible that led to the end of slavery in this country. How many of you know that abolitionists used the Bible to prove their point? That's why slavery ended in this country. It's because of the Bible. And we need to understand that. We need to get that. Now, how about the Sabbath day? We, we looked at the Sabbath day, and you got in Numbers chapter 15, somebody getting stoned for working on the Sabbath day. Listen, put it in the context of history and put it in the context of the Jewish nation. This was a nation that was supposed to be a nation of priests. They were supposed to, to, to tell all the pagans around them, God is holy, and we're going to show you by living a very special life that proves that God is holy. We represent Him. We demonstrate His holiness. We demonstrate His perfection. So the ideal, the ideal, what, what, what's in the Ten Commandments? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's right there. It's in the Ten Commandments. So God gave them ways to remember the Sabbath. But in Numbers chapter 15, there's a guy that gets, uh, that gets killed for picking up sticks on the Sabbath. Why? Because, you see, he wasn't just picking up sticks. The very day before, God had said, you shall not do this. And he went, watch me. It was a flat, deliberate, I don't care what God says. I don't care what the society is doing. I'll do whatever I want to do. It was flat out rebellion against God. It had nothing to do with the Sabbath day. It had to do with God, I'll do what I want. And in fact, they were, they were stunned by it. They were stunned by the audacity of it. And they, they took him into custody and they went, what do we do with him? They had to go to God and say, we, we don't know a man's heart. Is he really deliberately doing this or was it an honest mistake? And God said, I know men's heart. That's what his attitude was. You shall stone him and make sure you get it. Does that make sense? It's, now, there's no warrant for us to go out and stone people today for not keeping the Sabbath. There's no warrant for that. But deliberately, how many of you know the wages of sin is what? Death. Okay, you're all under a death sentence anyway because you've all sinned. It's just a matter of when. Does that make sense? Nothing has changed here. But the point is, now listen, we're not a theocracy today. We are not the Jewish nation. So no, I don't think we should uh, have, you know, Sabbath laws the way they did then because I think that was completed in Jesus Christ who said that the Sabbath was made for who? For you. It's supposed to be a rest day. It's not supposed to be, you know, so harsh on you. That's not the point. But, you know, I told you that these laws were supposed to express or illuminate or show us the Ten Commandments in some way. Think about this. If God cares so much about a Sabbath day for you to remember his goodness and his holiness and his truth, that for the Jewish people he prescribed the death penalty for not making it, should you be at church next Sunday? I mean, seriously. You think about that, go, wow, he was pretty serious. Maybe I ought to get out of bed. Right? But we don't take the Sabbath day seriously, do we? We should. It's in the ten. It's there. If they prescribed death for it at one time, maybe we ought to take it a little more seriously. That's what we should learn from that. How about the shellfish thing versus the homosexuality? Remember how he said that? You know, they're both an abomination. How can you say one is worse than the other? Listen, the idea today is to try to say that homosexuality is no worse, I thought you'd like that, is no worse an abomination than eating shrimp. Okay? Now, that's the idea today. And the implication is, since we eat shellfish today, why don't we simply accept homosexuality today? Well, the answer is, again, the Ten Commandments. We've got to look at the categories. Now, it's kind of like the difference between real estate law and moral laws. In the United States today, it is illegal. I was a real estate agent once upon a time, and it is illegal to lie when you write out your loan application. Did you know that? It's called fraud, and you can go to jail for it. You can also go to jail if you're an adult sleeping with an 8-year-old. But there is a world of difference between these two laws, isn't there? They're both laws. They're both laws, but there's a world of difference. 
You see, the Ten Commandments says you shall not commit adultery. You know what adultery is? Adultery is any violation of God's standard in Genesis 2. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Okay? Just, sorry. That's a violation. And for the Jewish people, God wanted them to understand you don't mix ideas. And if you look at these animals that were considered unclean in those days, they were all a mixture of things. Or they did unclean things. You didn't eat vultures because they ate dead things. Not a good plan. Right? They're an unclean animal. And it was designed to show, in context of those people, it was designed to show them and to remind us that there are things that are unclean. So yes, today we are free to eat shellfish, but the prohibition against doing unclean things does not change ever. And it's very clear, you shall not commit adultery. That's in the 10, and that's forever. That's forever. So any kind of an unclean mixture, that's what eating shellfish was supposed to remind us of. Now, so when people tear things out of context like this, out of their historical context, when they try to say that the morals from the Bible can't be applied today if, unless we apply all of the other laws, that argument fails. We've just made that point, haven't we? That argument fails. The Ten Commandments are the law of God, and they are forever. The 613 were an expression of that that was completed in Christ. But the Ten Commandments, they apply to you forever. And every single person in this room has violated all of them. All ten. You all have. Every one of you. In fact, if you look closely, the Bible tells us that the, the whole law, the law of Moses, everything, was a schoolmaster to show us that we all fall short of the glory of God. Because even the Israelites with their 613 ways of trying to obey the Ten Commandments couldn't do it. And you can't either. You need the blood of Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, just like the Israelite people needed all of those sacrifices and those feasts to wash away their sins. You do too. And that's the last key we need to get. You see, God's law, the Mosaic law and the Ten Commandments that never applies to everybody, is designed to show His great love in giving His Son as the ultimate sacrifice because we all fall short of His standards. All of us do. Now, I hope that helps you with some of those things. Does that help you a little bit with answering some of those difficult things? Well, next week we're going to have a fun one. You're going to like it. How many of you are getting something out of this? Is it good for you? Yeah, Good. Then let's pray and worship. <laughs> Father God, we worship you because you're holy. Yeah, try.